My Lords, I stand here today deeply honoured to be a member of Your Lordship's House and also proud to be sitting alongside my first boss, my noble friend Lord Kirko, who gave me my first tour of this place in 1996 when he was a member of the Lees North East in the other place. Looking around this historic chamber, I recall him proudly telling me how it was built using limestone from Yorkshire. And I like to imagine that the seam of rock each building block is carved from runs all the way to Micklefell, the highest point in the historic county of Yorkshire, close to where my grandparents, the Elliots, lived. I thank noble lords on all sides of the house, as well as Black Rod and her staff, the doorkeepers, police officers, advisers, and all of the other wonderful staff for their warm welcome and guidance. I also congratulate my noble friend, Lord Marx, on his excellent maiden speech. I note that he was born on the other side of the Pennines to me, so I'll resist making any further reference to Yorkshire. I'm grateful for the advice I received from noble friends in preparation for today, in particular my mentor and noble friend, Lord Kamal, and noble lords Borick and Kirkhope, who introduced me to the House earlier this year. When I mentioned to another noble friend that I was planning to make my maiden speech on the 9th of May, they said, in rather more colourful language than this, really? That's Europe Day. Are you going to talk about Brexit? That's a subject I do not intend to revisit, at least today. I'm instead delighted to have the opportunity to speak about something far more foundational, which is far closer to my heart, the subject of business as a force for good in delivering skills and training opportunities. And I thank the noble Lord, Lord Aberdeer, for raising this very important subject today. Our nation's prosperity is firmly anchored in the vigour of our business, business community, a truth echoed by the very fabric of this chamber. The wool sack before us, symbolising the historical wealth from the wool trade, serves as a constant reminder of the essential role of business in creating the prosperity our nation enjoys. In terms of our future prosperity, 64% of apprenticeships in England are provided by businesses, almost double the number offered by colleges, schools and public bodies combined. And I'd like to use this opportunity to pay tribute to my right honourable friend, Robert Halfon, who has championed apprenticeships throughout the, his parliamentary career in the other place and leaves behind him the tremendous legacy of the Lifelong Learning Act. We should also remember that civic-minded business leaders familiar with this place are behind some of the most successful schools in the UK, not <coughs> least the JCB Academy, the Ashcroft Technology Academy, the Harris Federation and the Dixon's Academy Trust. And we should never forget that businesses large and small, from the smallest corner shop to the largest supermarket chain, are responsible for generating the tax revenue that funds our education system. Take Sainsbury's, for example. They typically pay in excess of £2 billion annually to the Exchequer, enough to fund 50,000 teachers, 100 new secondary schools, or nearly half of the entire adult education budget. To repeat, the business community is essential to the skills debate, whether through the provision of training, the establishment of schools, or the payment of taxes that fund our public services. But on top of this, businesses are also a powerful engine for social justice. Earlier this year, the noble baroness, Lady Lane Fox, eloquently spoke about the vital role of business in tackling poverty, especially through the provision of high-quality jobs. This is a cause which I also champion as President of the Jobs Foundation, as declared in the Register of Interests. I am grateful to be supporting this work by my noble friend Lord Harrington and the noble Lord, Lord Mendelssohn, who both serve on our Advisory Council. As part of this role, I travel across the country, meeting local business leaders and entrepreneurs. The stories I hear are a powerful reminder of the direct impact that businesses have on people's lives. I recently visited a local London bakery called Dusty Knuckle. As well as serving delicious baked goods, they work with young offenders, helping them grow their skills and confidence through a combination of on-the-job training and mentorship in a successful, warm-hearted business. In the words of one of their trainees, I feel so much happier. I feel like a real person in the real world, like I actually exist. 
Another successful entrepreneur shared with me his father's story. Many decades ago, his father fell in with the wrong crowd and ended up in prison. After his release, he successfully completed a training course to drive fuel tankers across the country. The entrepreneur still vividly recalls the moment his father opened a telegram from Shell telling him they knew about his period in custody, but were still willing to give him a permanent job. It was, he told me, the one and only time he ever saw his father cry. These are just two examples of businesses being a force for good, and an illustration of why a successful society requires successful businesses. I will conclude with the words of Winston Churchill, who delivered many of his wartime speeches in this very chamber. Some people regard private enterprise as a predatory tiger to be shot. Others see it as a cow they can milk. Not enough people see it as a healthy horse pulling a sturdy wagon. I look forward to working with noble lords across the House to make sure that more people have access to these opportunities in life and to, uh, and to ensure that we support businesses to do even more good in the local communities they serve.